Very good. Christine's on it. Bishop, what say you? Shall we begin? Yes, I think we should. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Pastor Brenda Boss. I am here with Interim Bishop Murray Fink and Pastor James Phillips, who is our African Descent Coordinator, will also be participating via, uh, via video this morning. So I am going to share my screen, which means that I cannot see you. So if I share something that you cannot see or hear, I would cover uh, you telling me so. Otherwise, I'll just blindly go on. So uh, when Bishop, uh, Interim Bishop Murray Fink came to be with us, um, one of the things he asked our staff was, what work shall we get done in this interim time between uh, his arrival and the arrival of a new uh, bishop? And our staff felt that in empowering lead leaders within congregations was a very important part of what we wanted to get done. And we saw that it was gonna be very helpful for congregational presidents and vice presidents to be given some additional information and additional encouragement. So um, as we begin this morning, I would like to thank you. Thank you for your yes to your congregation. Thank you to your yes to ministry. Um, thank you to your yes to serve God in your unique uh, context. Um, so I wanted to tell you again that this is the three people who are participating this morning, Reverend James Phillips, who is our coordinator of African Descent Ministries, me, Pastor Brenda Boss, I'm the assistant to the Bishop for Rostered Leadership, and in my portfolio of responsibilities are coordinating some educational events, and uh, Bishop Murray Fink, who is serving, as you know, as our interim bishop. So we're going to begin with a devotion from Reverend James Phillips. I need to now change screens, so give me just a moment. And um, let me stop sharing for just a second. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? Let me tell you how this is gonna work. Um, we'll have our presentations and then we'll have a time for question and answers at the end of, the, uh, at the end of our time. We expect to be here for about an hour and 15 minutes. Bishop, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, um, uh, we, we will be going quickly over many different things and we'll have uh, maybe in the future a chance to spin out uh, in more detail some of, the, some of the things that we'll just be overviewing today. But uh, today's really a, a, an overview. Yeah, so uh, before we have devotions and uh, Pastor Phillips's opening comments, I'd like to invite all of us into a word of prayer. Again, thank you so much for being with us. The Lord is with you and the Lord be with you. Loving God, thank you for the ministries of Southwest California Synod and for all of these fine leaders who are serving you in their unique contexts. We ask that you bless this time that they are encouraged and inspired. And uh, as each piece of information comes, they can see how they can use that to glorify you and to um, improve the work that they are doing in their councils. We ask that you'll be with all who are suffering this day from COVID-19 and other afflictions. Thank you for the vaccinations. And we ask that that distribution will continue to go uh, quickly and smoothly. Be with all who are, um, are, are frightened or concerned this day. But also we ask that you'll bless those who are encouraged and hopeful. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So let me know if you cannot hear this. This is a video that Pastor Phillips was able to share since he wasn't able to be with us today. Um, I am looking at my screen. Let me stop it one second. Sorry, I want to check one more thing. Yes. Uh, this, this, this video with Pastor Phillips was recorded on Zoom. We had a little bit of technical glitch. So if he occasionally talks and his sound doesn't match, it's because of that. It's not your screen, it's mine. So here is Pastor Phillips. So I'm glad I have this time to, these few minutes to share with you um, about congregational vice presidents. And I wanna start off with um, some scripture. And this is taken from Ephesians chapter four. And it's beginning with the 11th verse. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God 
and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I know that's a long passage, but the main theme from that passage is Paul is urging us to recognize that each one of us has an important role in the body of Christ. Each role is important, but each role is different. Some are pastors, some are teachers, some are apostles. And even in our church today, the role of congregational president is different from the role of pastor. But guess what? The pastor's role is not more important than the congregational president. And the congregational president's role is not more important than the pastor's. Each of us equally perform a different function that unites as a team and enables the body of Christ to be successful and efficient in the mission of Christ. I think that the most successful has been when we start off with understanding what the mission statement is of that particular congregation. It's important for the congregational president to know and for the pastor. Whether the pastor is new to the congregation or the pastor has been there a while, she should know what the mission statement is of the congregation. And the president should know what the mission statement is. They should go over that together. Once they get a common understanding of what the mission statement is of that particular congregation, then you need to look towards discussing what the pastor's vision or the pastor's goals are for achieving that mission statement so that the church can operate at its best. That means that you need to be honest and bring everything to the table. If you disagree with any part of the pastor's vision, or their stated goals. It's a little baby one. You need to bring those up in a one-on-one meeting. I'm very pleased not with how the fast went. I'm not ruining it. And not in front of the whole congregation and not in front of a whole committee. So you would reject this for your students. You need to come to an understanding so that both of you are on the same page. If you see this, this is going to make slide, it, it then easier it best presented in for present anyone because then there's the congregation like, president this is what it would look and like for the passion. Like I am with you guys. And this is way too much. Supposed to go over Sorry, passion. I want to ask so for everybody to please mute mode, so like that uh, so we can uh, hear the video. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the video now. The pastor and the congregational president need to support each other. And that doesn't mean that you always need to be in agreement. But it ne- means that you need to discuss and find out where you agree and where you disagree and try to come to common ground so that you can present a unified front for the entire congregation. That's the way that you're going to be most successful. If there's any division, then the congregation is going to pick up on that. The other council members will pick up on that. And then you start concentrating on the differences and the divisions instead of the common mission that everybody has together. Okay, after you discuss the um, pastor's particular vision and goals, you need to discuss the strengths and the weaknesses of the congregation. That's also a point of honesty that needs to be um, where the pastor knows what the congregation is good at and what they're not so good at. Every congregation does not have to be good at everything, just as every pastor is not good at every every single part of the ministry. <laughs> now, um, I'm speaking for on behalf of other pastors because, of course, I'm great at everything in the ministry. No, see? And if you hear any pastors say that, then you know you immediately need to pray for that pastor because they're not telling the truth. And also, besides strengths and weaknesses of congregational congregations, 
and of pastors, we, we as pastors, we also have special interests because of our training, because of our background experience. We have things that we enjoy doing better in the ministry and some things that we don't enjoy so much. And so you also need to know that because the congregation may have strengths and areas that, that the pastor doesn't want to en necessarily engage in or lead in. And that's where the congregation can take the lead. But all of these things can be found out by having several meetings with the pastor. You need to have a growing relationship where it's deepening over the years. That's primarily achieved by a meeting with the pastor at least twice a month. And after COVID, you know, we can break bread together. And that's always a good way to, um, to get to know each other. Then you need to also look at the issues of contention. This is especially for a new pastor in the congregation. They don't know where the skeletons are hidden or where they're buried. They don't know um, what's happened in the past and where you had conflict. And so bringing up past conflicts is not necessarily a bad thing because you can come to the point of having this pastor understand where he or she needs to work on with the congregation on those issues of contention. Because those issues of contention, if they're not dealt with, they will come up along the way and they will sabotage your good relationship with that pastor. Um, it's not a time to bad mouth the, lad, the last pastor or the last council or any members of the church, but it's an opportunity to say, what were the issues behind the disagreements? What were the issues behind the, um, the tenseness and the confrontations that you had in the past? Not the people, but the issues. Once you deal with those, then you can prepare yourself so you don't have those same pitfalls and fall into those traps along the way in the future. So I will go over those again. You need to have a strong mission statement that the congregation agrees with, and you need to share that with the pastor and there needs to be understanding exactly what that mission statement means to you and the congregation. Then you need to discuss with the pastor what her vision and her goals are for the congregation in operating under that mission statement. This cannot take place in just one meeting. You need to meet with the pastor at least twice a month, and especially before a council meeting. You also need to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of your particular congregation, the things that you do well and the things that you don't do so well, and even stuff that you want to improve on. And the pastor can provide maybe opportunities for you to get trained as a congregation so that you can improve in those spots where you're weak. And then the last thing is you need to look at issues of contention in the past. Now, I know you're saying, Pastor Phillips, our congregation has never had any issues of, con of contention in the past. Well, then the pastor needs to pray and lay hands on you because that probably is not true. Um, but you don't get into the personalities that were involved in these contentions. You look at the issues and the causes of the problems in the past and deal with those. These are not people problems. These are issue problems that come along the, the way when congregations, when human beings get together, okay? So I pray for you to have a great relationship with your pastor, whether that pastor has been there a long time or where that pastor is new. I hope that you will renew your relationship with the pastor as congregational president. And as you pass on the torch to the next congregational president, you will let them know all of these things that can make a great building relationship between you and the pastor. Thanks for listening. Terrific. Okay. So once again, I want to remind you that we will have a time for question and answers later in the, in the uh, training. So uh, certainly make a note if you're, if you're taking notes on things that you want to discuss. Uh, and I do want to invite everyone to uh, stay muted so that uh, we don't have any outside uh, distractions. I am going to speak about, uh, first, I got to get my PowerPoint back up. 
I'm going to speak a little bit about congregational um, council meetings. And a lot of us meet uh, with congregational uh, council meetings with fear and trepidation because we think that they have to be long and not terribly interesting. And uh, that is just not the case. Sorry, I'm looking a little bit for my, I'm having a little trouble getting my PowerPoint back up. So give me just a second as I look to get this back on here. Where is it? Hmm. Sorry. There it is. So a few years ago, I attended a good governance meeting uh, in uh, Pacifica Synod about ways to love council meetings. And I didn't think it was possible. And then so, I implemented some of these ideas and it was very helpful. And so I wanted to share them with you today. The first thing that a lot of uh, council uh, meetings spend way too much time approving the minutes from the last meeting, looking at the financials from the month before, uh, maybe even looking at the pastor's report. And a wonderful thing that you might consider using is a consent calendar. What this is, is it's things that you have to approve every month and you tend to get bogged down in the first 20 to 25 minutes just doing those basic things. So I would encourage you to ask your pastor about sending out the things that can be approved en bloc a few days or a week before uh, your council meeting. What this will do is that you can have, like I said, the agenda, the minutes from the meeting uh, last month, uh, any reports that don't have much to say, let me sort of give you some examples. Maybe your pastor's report, if there's things that don't need to be discussed. So if your pastor gives a report every month, and maybe they do and maybe they don't, but if they say things like, um, I want to, uh, if the pastor says, I visited four people and I had my Bible study and I went to a council meeting um, with the city, the pastor may be able to put those things in a report that just comes to you and you don't have to talk about. If there are parts of the pastor's report that you should talk about, that can be action items separately. Um, if you have, and, and I've been in a lot of council meetings where all of the different department heads go around the table and say, I have nothing to report, or they feel guilty that they have nothing to report, so they talk for five minutes to say, I have nothing to report. So you can trim down a lot of your meeting by having any of your department head reports, maybe worship and music, maybe property, maybe education, maybe outreach. If there's nothing to report, their report can go into the consent calendar that says nothing to report and you can move on. So the first item of business on your agenda would be to approve and receive the consent calendar. So all of those things can just be on the, um, on the agenda as one end block thing. It's approved, nothing more to say. Now you can actually put your financials in there, but I highly recommend that those go out at least three to five days before the meeting and you have an email exchange there are any questions. This is not intended to be a way to sneak things past your leadership. It's a way to have conversation before the meeting to answer questions. If there are things in the passage report, in the financials, in something that you need to discuss, it's completely appropriate to say, I move we, we, we uh, accept the consent calendar except for the financials. And the group says, sure, consent calendar is approved. And now we talk about financials. What do you mean we spent $4,500 on water last month? What happened? And now you're having that conversation separately. Another idea that you might consider, and this is something that your pastor would need to agree is, with, is that you set your agenda based on your mission statement. This is a way for leadership to try to focus all action or as much action as possible on what you're trying to do as a congregation. So your agenda might be broken up into places that can, be, can meet your mission statement. For example, if your mission statement is a community of believers committed to passionate worship, joyful service, and the empowerment of leaders. Now I've made that up, but a lot of our mission statements do have different things that we agree that we wish to uh, focus on. So you might actually put a, an agenda together that focuses on passionate worship. 
And anything that you need to talk about that has to do with worship and music, that has to do with the children's message coming in, that has to do with what we're doing for Palm Sunday, all of that goes under passionate worship. The next part of your agenda has to do with joyful service. Now you have any of the service projects, any of the money that we need to send to Mexico for the house build, any of that stuff goes under joyful service. Now you have leadership empowerment. That will be any programs that you're developing to bring up new leaders. It might be a commitment each council meeting to do a little bit of leadership development, a little bit of training. Maybe you're doing a book study together as a council in which you're trying to, to improve your leadership. Any of those things can be put on there. Now, clearly, there are going to be times when you have to worry about something like putting a new roof on. I don't know where that would go in the passionate worship, joyful service, or leadership empowerment, but you might be able to always make your decisions, always find the way to spend your time on these things that match up a little bit better with your mission statement. You may not be able to do it all the time, but maybe you could do that uh, quarterly, or maybe your council retreat could be based on trying to move things to match up more closely with your mission statement. Another thing I would suggest is that you use your time wisely. And most of us would admit that one of the most frustrating things about council meetings is that they just seem to go on and on and on. It would be really great if each council meeting could find a way to allot time to talk about a big idea. And the way that you need to do that is make sure that you have enough time for that. Using a consent calendar might clear the way from some of the boring every month ants in a conversation. Get that handled in the first three minutes and then see if you can spend time uh, talking about one of your big ideas. If you've always wanted to do a regional VBS, if you've always wanted to open a food bank, we tend to wait until the end of the meeting to get to our new business and by then we're exhausted. So see if you can move your new idea to the top of your agenda so that people are much more fresh about it. Another thing you might experiment with is committing as a group to keeping your meetings to maybe only an hour and a half. Um, that, that means that you need to make sure that people are willing to do that. And you may be surprised that people are worried that somehow you're not gonna get your discussions done. You definitely wanna make sure that no one ever feels rushed, but you might be able to change the culture of your council meeting by saying we're really committed to 90 minutes. And maybe you'll even put times on the agenda saying consent calendar is gonna take so much time. If we do a Bible study at the beginning, that's gonna be 15 minutes. If we're going to do a book study, that's gonna be 15 minutes. And then maybe 30 minutes for a visioning discussion. This is revolutionary. And people might be very uncomfortable with it, but you might be able to experiment with a really step-by-step, -step, well enforced agenda. Again, it's extremely important that you make sure that all council members are okay with this. I admit that I did this in my last council and I had two people on council who were always anxious that we were somehow rushing decisions. And so we really wanted to make sure that they didn't feel bulldozed, that they could actually buy into the energy that was coming from the meeting as opposed to feeling like they were just getting shushed. And so you really have to see if your council members could bear that. Maybe you just need to experiment with the council meeting used to take three hours and we're gonna cut it down to two. Just something to see if you can try to get people feeling better about the use of their time. And that is the end of my time. So let me just move quickly through this and get us back to Bishop Murray Fink. Bishop, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for a moment and see if you are ready to go or if you have anything else that you wish to discuss. No, I'm ready to go, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, here we go. Just as a very short introduction, since I am the interim bishop and most of you I've not had a chance to meet, uh, I started my ministry uh, in 1975 and my whole ministry has been in California. My first 18 years as a pastor, I served three different congregations, a very small congregation in the Central Valley, and then a very large, fast-growing congregation in Fresno, and then a large congregation in a very changing community in Orange County. 
I uh, then went on to serve for almost six years as an assistant to the Bishop of the Pacific Synod, and then um, was elected uh, as Bishop and served for three terms, 18 years. So I've had my fair share of opportunities to be involved with congregations and their leaders over these years. And together, I would say we have uh, learned what uh, is most helpful and what pitfalls we ought to try to avoid. So I'm going to be going through rather quickly 10 best practices. And each of these could be a separate discussion on its own. You may be doing all of these already. But just in case you're not, uh, it might be good to review some of these. And it's certainly not the only best practices that congregations and leadership teams might be uh, exercising, but here are 10 that I want to offer. We could probably go into more detail about some of these at a later date. That uh, might be a, another helpful opportunity like this. And these are not listed in any necessary order of priority or importance. So Brenda's gonna help me do the transition since I don't control the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, for us as Lutheran Christians, Holy Scripture is always our primary guiding light. With the psalmist, we say, your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So it's God's word that shapes our mission and our ministry. However, organizationally, we all have constitutions. The ELCA has a constitution, the Southwest California Synod has a constitution, and your congregations have constitutions, and they all are being continually updated, or at least they should be. If your congregation has updated your constitution recently, I say congratulations. But if it hasn't, I suggest that that might be one of the things you do this year is form a committee and update your constitution. Remembering that the constitutions of our congregations must always be in alignment with both the synod and the churchwide expressions and their constitutions. It's the one way that we and the ELCA have chosen to walk and live together. And whether or not our constitutions are currently up to date, they are our governing document. And it's very important that we follow and attend to the governing document that is most currently approved by our congregations in a, a congregational meeting. I have to say, I won't, but I could tell you stories of when that wasn't happening and the complications that that created for congregations who decided to live differently than their constitutions were uh, trying to guide them. So please be familiar with your own constitution. It's important that all of your council members have a copy of it and they actually uh, read it. And then if and when you do revise it, uh, and vote upon it as a congregation, then please send an updated copy uh, to the Senate office for our files there. Uh, the next two points encourage you as presidents and vice presidents to always be mindful of the other elected leaders that have been called and willing to serve your congregations. Pastor James said at the beginning, um, as he invited us to think about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, that uh, from, from the very beginning, St. Paul was urging the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so one of our leadership tasks is to work together with other people who are called and elected to lead and to give them also the joy and affirmation of fulfilling their elected offices. And working with an executive committee uh, is very important for uh, to, get, to get more than one idea about how to go forward with an agenda and how to go forward with the ministry, but it also allows those people's input to help shape how the future of the meetings and the congregation is going to go. Holy Scriptures tell us that when two or more people are together, we can often do much more than one person alone. We have to remember how Jesus operated. Jesus was not a, a one-man band. He, he had a council. 
we call them disciples, but he chose the people around him to uh, help equip them for the work that was going to carry on the ministry that Jesus came to bring when he went back uh, to his heavenly home. So uh, let's utilize the people that have been elected to serve with us. I always uh, said to people over the years that if you don't utilize every elected leader of your congregation to serve in a function that gives them meaning and purpose, it would be like getting checks in your offering plate and not cashing them but just putting them in a drawer or letting them sit. And so as people are entrusted with an office of, of council member or executive committee member, uh, let's cash in on those gifts that they're offering and that they're giving for the sake of the mission of the church. So the next slide says, not just the executive committee, but every member of council. Councils should not be rubber stamps that just come uh, at a meeting once a month and approve something that someone else has decided is already the future of the church. But allow those council members to be part of the process, to be engaged, uh, to be working in between council meetings in different ways and capacities, and to bring their own gifts and skills to the ministry and the mission of leadership and of the congregation. Well, slide four reminds us of the importance of succession planning. As we lead a congregation and make uh, daily and weekly and monthly and annual decisions, wise leadership always looks for those who will follow in our footsteps and lead when our terms of office have ended. Uh, during the year and perhaps uh, even month to month, uh, leadership development uh, could be, and I would say should be, an important part of the work that we do in our leadership teams. Uh, besides just approving the minutes or a consent, a consent calendar, or hearing reports, and talking about the business before us for the next month, uh, to take time to develop the leaders that will be uh, the future leaders of the congregation, the future vice presidents and presidents. Uh, if any of you have served in the military, you know that you don't just join the Navy as an admiral that you rise up through the ranks. And if you've been part of a service club like Rotary or Kiwanis or Lions or Elks, we know that they don't choose a club president uh, just from the rank and file that's sitting there having breakfast or lunch together in those meetings. But these club presidents and these officers in the military come up through a system that prepares people for leadership over the preceding years. So the question that I would ask is, who are the people that are in your congregation, in your, on your council or in leadership in some way that perhaps are being uh, prepared and would be willing to follow in your footsteps when your time of service and term of office is ended? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the next slide talks about uh, what happens when we have differences of opinion. And Congregations that are not always like-minded with their leadership tend to have um, wonderful opportunities to really debate and dialogue and, and find compromising ways to serve the whole, the whole ministry. But often, unfortunately, uh, it could also lead to conflict and to disharmony. Pastor James already alluded to that when he talked about addressing the issues and never personalizing them. Uh, experts have identified various levels of conflict. The one that I like uh, to use, uh, it one has five levels of conflict. And in that uh, tool, that instrument that helps us better understand it and how to manage it, uh, it does tell us that four of those five levels of conflict really do create confusion, lack of harmony, and movement away from the mission and the goals of the organization. Only one uh, level of those five really is, is the helpful level. And that's when, as exactly as Pastor James said, it's when it addresses the issues and when it looks for a way to find um, through those 
uh, difference of opinion, something that the group can agree upon. As soon as we become unhappy with what someone else is saying and begin to personalize their comments, uh, then we start getting into an area that's undoubtedly going to lead to uh, conflict and confusion and, and chaos, something we all want to avoid as we're called to minister uh, to our communities and to our congregations as leaders and as the people of God. So there are a variety of tools that could help any council uh, through these times of better understanding and managing the times when people do come in with different opinions and different ways of thinking. And we should always uh, find good ways to allow that energy to be part of what shapes us for the mission that is before us. The next slide talks about codes of covenant or, or um, uh, codes of conduct or covenants of conduct. And if you don't have one of these already, I highly recommend it. And uh, my recommendation would be that after every new council is seated, after you've elected some new members, that you have a code of conduct that you go over. Uh, in the Conference of Bishops, we have what's called a relational agreement. And we agree that this is the way we will relate to one another. And this is the way we will uh, talk to each other about uh, life and, and matters within the whole church. And congregations can have those kinds of relational agreements too for their leadership that says, this is how we will address each other when we're not always in agreement. And this is what we will do and this is what we won't do. And these codes of conduct can be, and there's, there's so many out there. I have a file full of examples. Um, there, um, there's something that could be returned to year after year, maybe modified. My suggestion is that the beginning of every new council year, that you look at that, make sure everyone, everyone uh, will be ready to agree to it. And then if ever you find some of that conduct not happening in the council to be able to pull it out and remind people of that time when we sat down with this document and this is how we decided how to go forward, especially if there's some kind of hurdle in front of us that we're not managing very well right now. So if you don't have one, I suggest you uh, look at some models and create your own and adopt it and then follow it. Well, the next slide um, <clears throat> is one that uh, talks about observers and, evalu and evaluators. And I learned uh, many years ago the value of having a person or a small group of persons who are not on the council sitting with the leadership team as observers and process evaluators. Again, in the uh, Conference of Bishops of the ELCA, we've always had people sitting in our meetings, watching, observing, taking notes. And then at the end of, our, of the day, uh, then they would give us a report on what they experienced and what they saw. And we are all human organizations that can always learn and grow and do better in the days ahead than we have in the past. And so objective process observers to help a leadership team grow and mature in the ways that they guide and lead a congregation into its future are very, very valuable people to have uh, sitting at the table with you or on the Zoom meeting with you. There are other leaders in most uh, organizations, I'm moving on to the next one, uh, besides the governing board or the church council. And I believe it's always helpful to recognize them, to honor them, to listen to them, and to affirm them uh, for their ministry in the life of your congregation. Uh, so I would suggest that you always identify the other people in leadership who are not sitting on the council. And you might want to have a system of occasionally having one of them visit your meetings. Uh, so you can thank them, you can recognize the contribution they're making to the congregation, 
and then listen to what they would like to say to the elected leaders of the congregation. So I'm thinking of the leaders of your perhaps women's groups or men's groups or youth groups, uh, music directors, choir masters, office staff, uh, maintenance and custodial persons, ushers, money counters, and the list could go on and on. Uh, but these are also leaders that, that need to be affirmed, recognized, and also uh, to help them in equipping them, their ministry for the upbuilding of the church and the body of Christ. For the next two practices, I have a few additional slides. We know that planning always produces better results. And my recommendation is our planning uh, for the days to come for the future would be strategic, that it, it would be carefully outlined and thought through that it would be evangelical, that it would be filled with um, the mission of proclaiming the good news, mm -hmm. and that it would be missional, that it would be sending us forth with a purpose into God's future and into our own. So I have a few slides that say a little bit about planning. Uh, the next one says, uh, we embrace our mission by knowing whose we are, for God's people, and where we are being called by God to go. Uh, Peter Drucker, who goes, goes back some time, but uh, still was quite a guru on, on good leadership, says that planning is the art of doing the important. Planning gets us and moves us to uh, the top of the list of our priorities uh, and uh, important ministries. Planning, um, <clears throat> the next slide says, moves us forward to become future oriented rather than pointing us back and being past oriented. I came to serve a church one time and their council meetings were all about the past. They were reporting about what had happened the previous month. And like uh, Pastor Brenda said earlier, if there ever was any discussion about how to move forward, uh, they will put that at the very end of the meeting when we were all ready to go home. Well, we needed to change that and to start thinking about being future oriented and spend much less time uh, just celebrating and looking at what had happened in the past. The next slide um, <clears throat> reminds us that planning improves our vision, our action, and the implementation. And so these next uh, few slides just walk through some of the the primary steps of how when we plan, we meet the needs of the community, both the congregation, but also the community around us to whom we're giving witness. And here are some steps for that. We spend time envisioning uh, what God is calling us to do and setting some priorities for ourselves based upon our mission statement or our constitution and what the people in our congregation are saying needs to be our priorities and we set some goals. And then with the goals set, then we move on to setting a timeline. Let's uh, take this on for the next year or two years or four years or six months, whatever the timeline might be. And then we move to uh, empowering the necessary work groups that if we're going to do this, who's going to actually get the job done? And this next slide, I think is a very important one. No matter how good and how important the goal, if you can't get people to work together on it, then take it off the table. Uh, it might've been a good idea, but if people aren't willing to give time and energy to it, then move on to one that they will. And finally then, uh, or not finally, but uh, implementation and follow through. A uh, quick, quick story. I, I worked with a congregation once. We had um, we had paper all over the walls with all of the plans and what they were going to do. And at the end of the meeting, um, they rolled them all up, put a rubber band around them, and the pastor walked out of the room, out of the fellowship hall with them. And about six months later, I went back to that congregation. They were having some difficulty. And I said, well, how are, how are you doing with all those plans we talked about? And he pointed to the corner, and there was that roll of newsprint rolled up with the rubber band around it. They had not gotten back to it. 
they they simply um, uh, they stalled at this point, and it was part of the problem because they had people who wanted to move forward, and all of those plans that whole day was sitting there rolled up in the corner. Well, then let's move on. <clears throat> Uh, there should always be a time to uh, evaluate a planning uh, process and then to celebrate as those plans are fulfilled. I, um, I worked with a congregation, Hawaii was part of the Pacifica Senate, on one of the islands in Hawaii that had been talking about parking lot lights for more than 10 years. They knew they needed them. Uh, they had groups that came in the evening and their own council came in the evening and it was very dark where their congregation was located. And they talked about it and they talked about it and nothing happened. So then um, they invited an outsider to come in and we sat down and we actually created a plan for how to get this done. And they invited me to come back six months later when they had their turning on the lights celebration in the evening not only with the whole congregation there and a lot of great food, but they invited all the self-help groups that were using the congregation in the evening too, and carefully walking through dark parking lots to go to their meetings. And it was a wonderful event. And after more than 10 years of talking about it, it took a plan and the implementation and finally it happened. Well, I wanna wrap up very quickly um, <clears throat> with this final piece here. Uh, it talks about leadership imperatives. And a little of my inspiration for that uh, came from a book, and I really don't like the title of the book. The book's called Being the Boss. And when I think about the church, I don't think about bosses. Uh, only I think about Brenda Boss, but that's the only one. Um, I, I think of ministers and uh, people who are called into ministry. But this book wasn't written for the church, but you see the name Linda Hill on there. And Linda right now is one of the people that is working with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America to help equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. She's working with uh, people in our churchwide offices. She's working with synodical bishops and she's helping us to uh, work on the way that we are leading our church into God's future, into the mission that we know we are called to be about. So what I like about Linda's book and, and Kent too, is that it has three imperatives. And the first one is managing ourselves, ourselves as whatever leadership position that you're in. And the next slide tells us that uh, the second uh, prior, uh, the second imperative is managing the networks, the, the organization that we're leading. And then the last one is to manage our team, our specific team that we're called uh, to be working with. In this case, I would say we would call it the church council. So I want to break those down just for a minute and talk about what it means uh, when we manage ourselves. Part of that is uh, the is accepting the fact that we've been given an authority, uh, a trust to lead a group of people, that we have influence, that uh, people are uh, giving to us as they elect us to be a president or a vice president or whatever role it is, and that our relationships with others in the congregation and in the leadership are critically important. So how do we lead? We, uh, there, there are a variety of tools out there that would help us know uh, our style of leadership. Uh, this next slide shows that there are so many different ways uh, that people can lead. <clears throat> uh, we can be authoritative or autocratic, or we can be achieving, uh, direct, uh, directing, uh, directing our ministry toward achieving. We can be mostly concerned about how we affiliate with the others. Uh, we can be coaches and servants and there you can see the, the list and that's just part of the list right there. It's best to understand what your style of leadership is. And again, there are tools that will help you do that. And you know uh, from your own uh, style of leadership, how you are being called uh, to leave this church with the gifts that you've been given in your baptism and by God as one of God's chosen people. 
that in this case has been caught called to lead as a congregational president or vice president. The next slide talks about managing our network. And I've already spoken about that, but that's just understanding our organization. Again, our, what does our constitution say? What is our mission and what does our mission statement say? And are we lifting this up in front of the other leaders of the church? What are the key relationships that we as uh, will need to have with our executive committee, with every member of the council, with the rest of the congregation? And how are we always about the work that St. Paul called us to be about of equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ? And then the next slide talks about managing our team. And that's the, that's the group that you have been uh, given to work with. Uh, so share the, as we've already talked about, share the, the joy of leadership, empower them, uh, delegate and allow every person to feel uh, truly uh, <clears throat> meaningful in the ministry that they've accepted as they've uh, become a member of the council. If there are subgroups and your people are uh, that you're working with have oversight in a subgroup, uh, ministry descriptions are so important so they know exactly what they're being asked to do and that they have a guideline and a map for them in doing the ministry they've been called to do and that they can pass that on to the next person who will follow them in that position when their term of office is over. And finally, spend some time with them doing a team assessment, like you did the self-assessment with yourself. Uh, have all of them fill out uh, an assessment and find out what kind of leaders you're working with. How many of the people you're working with are influencers and really do want to uh, say their piece and maybe get their way? And how many are uh, affiliators and want to make sure that everybody is getting along? And where are the achievers? in your congregation? And who are the, uh, who are the coaches and uh, the different people that uh, would fill out uh, those uh, tools of uh, leadership style in different ways? And then look at the whole picture and see how gifted your council is, uh, hopefully with a variety of people with a variety of gifts that can help you lead together uh, in, in a, uh, a plan and a mission that you might be able to agree on. So I think, um, you know, there's so many other resources. Uh, we could spend time with every one of these practices. Here's another book by Linda Hill, by the way, along with uh, uh, three other people. And it's called The Art and Practice of Leading Innovations, Collective Genius. And it really is a book that uh, talks and encourages us to think about being innovative uh, today as we are called about, uh, are called to uh, do ministry that takes us into the days and, and into the future ahead. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to have time now for uh, question and answers. And I'm not sure, Brenda, if we're going to go into small groups uh, with this size group or not with the time that we have remaining. Well, Bishop, thank you. It's 9.55. We had allotted another 20 minutes. I think it might be nice to send people off for maybe 10 minutes to even, I know there won't be a lot of time for discussion, but um, even just to sort of say if there's pieces of this that have kind of risen up for you as something that you're excited about, um, as you can imagine implementing, uh, something like that. So if it's okay with you, Bishop, I think I'd like to split people off for uh, into maybe groups of four um, and what's going to happen, I think most of you know how to do this, but you will be invited to a breakout room and uh, just say yes, and then we will, um, we will uh, invite you back in about 10 minutes. And then we'll have a little time for some Q&A. Yep, yep, here we go. So go ahead and take the invitation. I'm hoping it's happening. <laughs> 